All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for having us here. Let me first start by saying uh, how proud I am of James. I mean, there's no way to exaggerate what state James was in when I first met him and what God has done in his life. And, you know, I think sometimes we, uh, we take for granted or forget the truly dramatic resurrection power of the gospel. I mean, the, the, the idea isn't that we're people who are trying to be better at being good people. That is a ridiculous idea. We are dead people who are lost, who are resurrected by Christ. We were dead in sin. And this is everybody, but some of us wore it on the outside more apparently, like James, myself, maybe many of you in here who, who have lived in the dark side of life. But Christ came to seek and save the lost, and I'm very proud of you. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've been here several times. Uh, my name is Pastor Josh West, and I'm the pastor and program manager of Sunrise Adult and Teen Challenge in Cache, Oklahoma. Of course, I've been friends with your worship pastor and her husband for many, many years, and most of you here know me for many, many years. So uh, thank you for inviting me to come back. I uh, Always great to see Brian and Thomas and, of course, uh, Miss Dennis today. Tell him that I, I missed him, that I love him. Uh, always an honor to come be able to preach God's Word. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There's a message that we're going to preach out of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me there. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The title of this message is called Culture of Self. Culture of Self. You know, we're, uh, we're united in Christ under the banner of, of uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But also this book, this is, what, this is what separates us from other religions. Now, there are religions that in our culture that will tell you that they believe in Jesus too, Jesus and. But let me tell you something, that there is no such thing as a religious uh, belief system that is compatible with Christianity. It's either or. It's not both and. And, in, and unfortunately for us as the church, the idea of this sort of blending together is something that has gradually happened in our culture. We, we've blended with so many other religions, sometimes uh, in, in, in a very sort of um, slow process. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And as Christians, I want to start before I read the text and get into the sermon to remind us, and I don't mean this to sound militant or mean, there is no unity outside the truth. There is no unity outside the truth. You know what we're unified under? The truth. If we love people, guess what we give them? The truth. Not what they want to hear. Listen, when I was in addiction, I know what I wanted to hear, but eventually somebody told me the truth about who I was and where I was headed and what my life was headed towards. They didn't say, you know, hey, Josh, you're doing a great job. Just try a little hard and clean your act up. No, someone looked me in the eyes and said, you are physically and spiritually nearly dead, spiritually completely dead, physically almost dead. And listen, if you want to transform your life, you're going to have to surrender it to Christ. Being a Christian isn't about... Um, trying harder to do better. It's about unbridled, unconditional surrender to God. The end. And the way we know how to be Christians is not based on our feelings or what our culture tells us or what pop culture tells us or what televangelists tells us, but this book. This book. The holy, sacred words of Scripture. So, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, 
without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Lord, I thank you for your word, God. I thank you for the gospel. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to speak to brothers and sisters who are in Christ and maybe a few who are not in Christ, Lord, and to be able to expose them to the saving grace of God, Lord, through the gospel, Lord, through the preached word of scripture. Lord, I pray that your spirit right now, God, would do a work that only the spirit of God can do, and that is to break ground in a heart that is hard, Lord, a heart that is lost, even people who believe that they're good or, or that they are Christians because they attend church, because they stop doing drugs or, or whatever else, God, that we would be able to realize that the only reason we are good is because your goodness is in us, because we have imputed righteousness, a righteousness that you gave to us through your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I pray in these next few minutes that we would be uh, corrected, God, we'd be encouraged and we'd be unified under the truth, Lord, as we live our lives to shine bright in a lost, dying, and dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think obviously <laughs> ah, there's a lot of negative things, right, in that text of Scripture. It sounds sort of bleak. You know, obviously it says, in the last days. You know, I think oftentimes we hear that terminology and immediately we think about the end of time or the end of days or the last of the last days. But theologically speaking, biblically speaking, the last days actually began as Christ ascended. That's the last period of time. You know, the time when Christ ascended, these are the last days. So we we're talking about, you know, the last days were hundreds of years ago. Ever since Christ has ascended, those are the last days. But there will be the last of the last days. And obviously no one knows specifically when those times will come. As I've grown as a, you know, an older man in life and I've lived some life in this, this culture, you know, I, it seems like, it feels like by our American context that we are in, in the last days, right? But I feel like preachers like D.L. Moody or Tyndale or even people 300 years from Christ probably felt that way because sin has always been a problem in the earth since the garden. And so obviously in our particular American context, things do look bleaker than they have looked before. Um, and so it can be easy to think, man, maybe this is the end. But the truth is, even though sin has always been a part of life and culture, there is this indication by this text that as we approach the end, that this sort of flagrant sort of blatant sinful life this uh it will be out in the open more and more it's definitely true in our culture just turn on the news you know we live in a time when right is wrong where truth is subjective they're really listen what you feel is right is probably okay the question is what happens when your feeling about what's true and good contradicts with what my feeling about what is true and good who decides what's right and wrong? And there is no possibility of having a moral, ethical society without a giver of morality, a giver of truth. And this is what we have God's word for. Now, I know as people who claim Christ, we all will rally behind that, right? And say, yes, I, I believe that, or at least I think most people would. But as we begin to dig into the scripture and we find the things in our life don't necessarily add up. The question is, what do we do? Do we say, well, that's just who I am. That's just how our culture is. That's the way things, that's how I feel. Or do we compare ourselves to the scripture and let Christ conform us to his image? The only person who's willing to do the second thing is someone who is truly reborn in Christ. Let me contextualize 2 Timothy for you very quick. So just a quick Bible lesson here. 2 Timothy was probably the last epistle that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. The Apostle Paul was sitting in a Roman jail when he wrote this letter to the son in the faith that he'd been mentoring for years, Timothy. 
the son that he, he thought so much of. So basically, just days or weeks before his head was departed from his body by a chopping block and an axe, Paul had an opportunity to write a letter to his son in the faith, who is also a pastor, and give him this letter of encouragement. So if you knew that your life was ending very shortly, what would you write to a person who you are a mentor to or to your son, especially in their, their lives when the central focus of their life was the gospel and forwarding the gospel to the ends of the earth? So when we read 2 Timothy, it's important for us to realize the sort of sense of urgency in this letter as Paul is communicating to his son in the faith the things that he thinks are most important and most paramount. When we look at 2 Timothy 1-5, through 5, it's interesting that it doesn't say, listen, in verse 5 it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. It's interesting that it doesn't say, these are the way the pagans live, so don't live like the pagans or the sinners. No, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. This is not a description that we would expect to be attached to something having to do with godliness. This is a description that we would expect from the world, right? Prideful, lovers of money, abusive, self-centered, egotistical, loving pleasure of themselves rather than pleasuring or the love and pleasure of serving God. But it doesn't say don't live like the pagans do. It says this group of people had and will have a form of godliness. When you look around our country today, we have a form of godliness, don't we? You could run to, there's people who call themselves atheists. I know some. But for the most part, you run into most people and they have a form of godliness. Listen, there are churches all across our country that have a form of godliness. There's parts that they don't really care for in this book too much. So they, they don't really emphasize too much on those parts, right? A, a Christianity where we create a Christ that conforms to our image rather than us conforming to his. This description would be expected of pagans, but not of a church. But it seems almost like that's what Paul's talking about here. A self-centered and proud, abusive, greedy, ungrateful, unholy church. A church that values personal comfort and pleasure above God. A pointless and powerless church that has a form of godliness, but ultimately is powerless because it isn't producing life-transformed saints who live holy lives according to the Scripture. You're almost not invited to preach many places if you use words and phrases like living a holy life before God. But Peter says, listen, there is a holiness without which no man will see God. So the fact that we're imperfect shouldn't be, well, you know, nobody's perfect. Let's just set our standards low. Listen, the idea that you don't want to live like Christ probably shows that you don't belong to him. And it darn well shows that you don't love him. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I am talking about having a re-changed, a reoriented, a different heart than you had when you lived among the world living for yourself. I'm not a perfect person by any stretch of the imagination. But my heart's desire is different than it once was. I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm living for God and for others. And as Christians, it's not the job of the minister. That's the job of the church. Church isn't supposed to be some entertainment nonsense, driven, sort of pacifying thing where we cram people into a room and make them feel good about themselves for an hour, an hour and a half. It's a place where saints converge and reason from God's word and then go out to a world and live a life that's different from the world so that we can change the world by the power of the gospel. Let's be reasonable here. We love some, sometimes we love to talk about spirituality because it makes us feel good. But God also created us with minds. And the Bible says, if we want to live a life of reasonable worship unto God, that we need to 
Renew our minds. Renew our minds. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Just true and proper worship. This is basic Christianity. Offering your entire life as a holy offering to a holy God. He deserves it and he's worthy of it. If you don't see him as worthy, then you're probably not living your life that way. Then it says in verse 2, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Are we living for our will? Or has our life shifted to live for the will of God? See, in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, it kind of gives us what the pattern of the world is, doesn't it? Self-centered, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. Life's about us. And I'm afraid that parts of the church has crept into there that we've made church to be about us too. Church ain't about you. The Bible's not about you. Listen, Christianity is about Jesus Christ and our service to him. The glorious king of the universe that we sang about. Glory to King Jesus. At that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Listen, some will bow in honor while others bow in shame. But make no mistake, every knee will bow. And it will be for us in Christ the most glorious day of our lives. As we lay prostrate in front of the king that died for us and rose again. When we view the contextual backdrop of 2 Timothy, we see this urgency, this importance in Paul's words. Timothy was his son in the faith and he loved him. And he wanted him to be prepared for the persecution and the trouble that was coming. I mean, Paul's about to give his life up for the glory of God. Gratefully, joyously even. But he wants to prepare his young pastor son in the faith. To be prepared for the fact that there will be trial, there will be trouble, and there will be a false version of the church. In our lives as Christians and in our witness, we must stop trying to present the gospel as if there will be no trouble or no trials. Sometimes we preach and sing about miracles, but we realize that they don't always happen instantly. See, the point of this life is to conform you to the image of Christ. Now listen, God's God. I don't know why he heals one one way and another a different way. I was in addiction for many years and I walked down to altars at churches and cried out, God, please heal me. Help me, change me. And he didn't do it instantly for for me. In his sovereignty, he used that season of my life to make me into the man I am today. A man who will never give up on somebody. A man that's been shown so much grace that that he has to have grace for somebody else. I didn't understand it at the time, but now I understand. But the reason I I felt bitter about it, didn't understand it, because my life wasn't about God. It was about me. Feel good messages might draw people in the door, but it won't sustain a church and it won't sustain a person's life. We need truth desperately especially in a culture now that tells us there is no such thing as truth. You know what the truth is? Whatever you feel and whatever you feel. And now we're to the point where we're arguing, and I'm sorry if I am get political and hurt someone. We're arguing if men can go in the bathrooms with our little girls. We've lost reality. We've lost the truth. And let me tell you why. It's because we've stepped away from this. All truth, like it or not. All truth is contained in this word from the God of truth, the holy God of the universe. Let's just look at a few of these character attributes really quick. Lovers of themselves. Are we willing to help others? Well, maybe if it doesn't inconvenience us too much. 
Maybe we're willing to come down and serve a little time at the church if they put it on the right day of the week. If it don't conflict with our sporting event or our son's endless baseball games or, or uh, the fact that maybe the church, there's not good air conditioning in that side of the church. We love ourselves and we're told by this culture and many within the church that that is the most important thing. Hey, love yourself. Take care of yourself. You can't be no good to anybody else if you don't take care of yourself. But that's not the attitude Jesus had. Jesus had an attitude that his life that was worth everything was worth laying down for you and me. And all God wants from us in return is the same. It's a reasonable sacrifice for a holy God who saved us. The church is full of self-love and self-help and your best life now garbage. What about self-denial? What about self-sacrifice? What about laying your entire life down in grateful service for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? That doesn't sound very appealing to you. Well, maybe that's because you're not really a believer. You ever consider that? If you, the idea of serving God with your entire life doesn't bring joy in your heart, you need to examine yourself and ask why. Many of you, if I said the same thing about your children, well, I'll die for my kids. You better stay away from my kids. I'll give all my money, all my time. But we can't have even something remotely close when it comes to Jesus Christ. Don't worry, I won't preach forever. Matthew 16, 24 through 27 said, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, which means accept their death. Their, Their life is over. Life is about now following Jesus. Pick up your cross and follow me. Here's what what Jesus has to say about self-love. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will surely find it. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone even give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is coming in His Father's glory with the angels, and then He will reward each person based on what they've done. How about lovers of money? You know, the idea that godliness is a means to financial gain. When you go down to your local Christian bookstore, you'll see that about 75% of the books are telling you that if you're a Christian and you follow this system, that you will be blessed and rich beyond your wildest dreams. And they may be smarter than me. But when I look at the scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, Paul says these words. Here are the things you should teach on and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise, they don't agree with sound instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ and godly teaching. They are conceited and understand nothing. Well, he's got more to say. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels and words that revolt, result in envy and strife and malicious talk and evil suspicions and constant friction between people who have corrupt minds and have been robbed of the truth because they preach that godliness is a means to financial gain. Let me stop there for a second. Where in the New Testament, if anyone wants to show me afterwards where the Bible promises, if you're a Christian, you'll be rich and blessed if you follow a system. Show me in the Bible afterwards. I would love to see it. Now, you can twist some things about Abraham, but you ain't ain't under the, the Abrahamic covenant. God's telling you to lay down your life and follow me. Give everything to Jesus and he'll give you back what you need. Well, don't we trust him? Is our treasure in this life or is it in the next? Let me finish reading the scripture. Paul says, listen, those who believe that godliness is a means to financial gain has been robbed of the truth. But for us, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we're going to take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many harmful and foolish desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered far from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It doesn't say being rich is a sin. It's saying the desire for wealth will pierce you with many griefs. Now listen, I'm not telling you if you go to work at your job or you have a business that I don't want it to be successful. I'm saying that we believe that God is our lottery ticket. And that is not the case. 
Listen, you know what you're promised in this world? Jesus. You know what you're promised? In the end, you will triumph in Christ. That's enough, and it should be enough. Now, if, listen, if you have a plumbing company and you work hard every day and you're honest with your employees, I pray that God blesses your business. And if you work at the factory downtown, you've been a faithful worker and you get promoted and you, you, you make a decent living, I'm happy for you. I'm not, I'm not shaming money. What I'm saying is the idea of thinking that wealth will solve our problems has crept into the church. And instead of saying, God, give me my daily bread, we say, God, give me a big pile of money and then I'll be fine. Lovers of money, boastful. James 4, 6 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. If we want to boast in something, 1 Corinthians 1, 31 says, for it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. How about pride? We could do a whole sermon on each one of these things. Pride is, it's impossible to be proud and be a Christian. It's impossible to be proud and to be right with God. Pride is an opposition of God's grace. Pride says that you bring something to the table. Pride says that your goodness is good enough. Pride says that I'm a little better than the next guy. There is no pr proud people in heaven. There won't be any good people in heaven either. They're just going to be sinners saved by grace. That's good news for someone like me. If I'm trying to make up for the deeds of my life, I've got to live a lot of lifetimes. But even the best of you, th those of you who never lived a life like I did, even your goodness isn't good enough. We need imputed goodness, imputed righteousness, given to us as a gift from a holy and perfect God who died for us. This is the beauty of the gospel. How about abusive? How about disobedient to parents? Isn't it funny he throws that one in there? We wonder why our culture hates authority. But we have glorified disobedience in our culture to the point now we're wondering why the people that we told they could live however they want, now they're grown up and we're confused. When the Bible says obedience to parents and authority is the bedrock of Christian homes. Listen, realistically, people who live in disobedience are just serving their father. And it's not Jesus. It's not God. Well, Jesus ain't the father. It's not God. In John 8, 32, Jesus is arguing with some Pharisees and they says, listen, he says, the reason why you guys won't listen to me is because you're serving your father. And you know who he is? The devil. Because if you don't live by God's word, you're living for yourself. And if you live for yourself, you're living for the devil. The Pharisees go, whoa, hang on, Jesus. We're Abraham's children. You know what he says? Listen, if you were really Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. You live holy, obedient lives to God. How about unholy? How about living a holy, humble life in honor of the God who saved you? Isn't that our, shouldn't that be our aim in life is to live holy lives where we, we look different than the world? We stand out because we're not living for ourselves, but we're living for others sacrificially, lovingly. When people mistreat us, we still love them in return. We give and expect nothing in return for it. Our lives are being poured out like a drink offering. Living a holy life before God. You can't have an affair with the world and be married to God. In fact, the Bible says you can't even be friends with the world. James 4, 4 through 5 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason, he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? God is a jealous God. He don't want us shacked up with the world. He don't want us living like the world and for the world. I know when we love sin, those words sting. They sting me and I'm trying to live my whole life for God because I'm not perfect. But that's why I live in humble subjection to the king that I'm believing is saving me through his grace. How about without love? We're almost to the end of this part. It's kind of... It was like a heavy yoke on my back. Without love. Listen, we could spend an entire sermon on this, but we got to remember that we have to define the word love biblically. Not the way our culture defines it. 
Not the way we define it. Biblical love is sacrificial. Biblical love is willing to suffer. Biblical love is willing to lay its life down in every way. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. If you love God and you're truly his, the evidence or the fruit of that will be first and foremost love, it says in Galatians 5. Listen, the fruit or the evidence that you actually belong to God is this. Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the ever-elusive self-control. Not perfection, but that should be what your life is manifesting. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, read it. It tells us this is what our lives should look like. Not self-centered, not, hey, I do a little bit to help them, but, you know, they're asking too much. Well, I'm not going to help that person again. They mistreated me. Is your life living for God or for yourself? You want to feel good about yourself? Then you can. There's people that, 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 that do a lot of good deeds in this culture who aren't even Christians. The difference is we're doing it for the glory of God because we realize this world belongs to God. Everything we have in our life belongs to God. And ultimately, our life is going to be eternal uh, through God. How about this, John 3, 16, God loved us so much that he gave. He gave the most precious gift he could give his one and only son. How about unforgiving? Here's something we all need to hear in the church. If you're unwilling to forgive somebody else, God will not forgive you. How do I know this? Well, the Bible tells me so. Matthew 6, 14. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly father will not forgive you. Well, Josh, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know how they lied to me and misused me. You're right, I don't. You don't know how they hurt me. But the reason we forgive is not because we're good people. It's because a person who has truly been forgiven of a lifetime of sin by the grace of God has nothing to stand on. How can you not be forgiving to that one person who wronged you when God has forgiven you of a lifetime of sin, a lifetime of self-centeredness? And if you don't see yourself that way as someone who's been forgiven a lifetime of sin, then you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian because you recited a salvation mantra one day that you didn't believe about a God you don't know. You're a Christian because you see yourself next to a holy God as a wretched sinner and you thrust yourself upon him for grace and forgiveness. And if that's the forgiveness that you've been shown by God, how are you not going to be able to show it to the person who mistreated you? The person that lied about you. Hey, and if they're lost, You should be loving them in a different way anyway. What do you expect lost people to do? Lost things. And if it's a person who calls himself a Christian, then you guys have a a recourse here. You both are called to be forgiving to one another. I know it's easier said than done. But this is the heart of the true Christian. Let me just brush through the last few of these before we get to the end here. Slanderous and without self-control. We don't have control over what we say or what we do, and we're fine with that as a culture. Brutal. We're a brutal culture. We love violence. We like to see people get their just desserts, don't we? Unless, of course, it's us, right? We'll walk around and we'll pound the table saying, give me my justice. You better give me justice. Except when we're the one who needs grace. And then we're like, oh, show grace and mercy to us. Show me grace and mercy. But here's the problem. We, we have a proper and improper view of our, our reality because we desperately need grace and, and mercy more than we do justice. We don't want God's justice. We want his grace. Whew. You all right, Debbie? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, let me get through these last one. Not lovers of good. I'm just being a little silly, but how about the movies we watch where we cheer the bad guy on? Why? The guy who... The, the, or, or when we, we when the person gets over on the bank and they, they get all this money, well, they probably deserved it. There are things in, a, in our culture that likes the bad guy to win, not lovers of good. How about treacherous, rash, conceited? Here's the final one. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Don't worry, it's heading somewhere positive in about five minutes. 
If one thing could be said about our culture is this, that we believe everything should be pleasurable, fun, and entertaining. We will spend hours watching sports and playing games or on our phone or watching movies. But if church goes five minutes over, we are so bored. Why won't this guy shut up? Why'd they do an extra song today? Don't they know I got places to go and things to do? You don't love being in church because the, it's not the, the essence of your heart. You love the other stuff. You make time for the things you love. I'm not trying to preach convicting at you. Listen, there was a time in my life where I prayed, God, help me want to want you. Change my heart, please. Because I love this stuff in this world. I love myself. And he is changing me. And he is changing you if you're in Christ. We know why the world is the way it is, but why is the church being drawn into this? I mean, let's think about, let's just think about it. I'm not being critical. I love the church. The, the church is the enduring symbol of God's grace. It's the bride of Christ. It's God's means for, for extending salvation to a lost and dying world, the church. But why are we susceptible to this? This isn't a hard thing what I'm about to say or some like secret knowledge. It's because we are no longer biblical. We don't know this word inside and out. We don't look in this thing like there's gold to be found in it. If I told one of you guys, listen, there's some scriptures in here, and if you can understand what they mean, and you, you'll study this thing for the next year, and you can come and explain it to me, I'll give you a million dollars. And you knew that I would really do it. I wonder how many people would get, to get in this book. Like there's something important to find inside of it. There is something important to find inside of it. There is a treasure that will last eternity. And this shows us how we're supposed to live in this life. Biblical Christians. There is nothing more important than God's word. The saddest part is most people who are false converts in the church believe they are biblical Christians. And then when you start spouting scripture at them, they think you're judgmental or mean. Do you believe most people are going to heaven? What leads you to believe that in the Bible? Do you believe that you're a good person? What leads you to believe that in the Bible? If a lost sinner, ah, here's a hard one. If a lost sinner can attend your church for weeks and months on end and leave feeling encouraged about the state of their life, then we've got serious problems. If there's never the moment of conviction that draws a lost sinner to salvation because the gospel is preached. The gospel isn't God loves you. The gospel is, listen, God is mighty and holy. You are a wretched sinner. And if you want to uh, inherit eternal life, you must throw your entire life on him. Surrendering all to him. Abandoning everything else. You're a, listen, there's only one first place in your life. There can only be one master of your life. In some of the final words Paul ever wrote Timothy, first, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, he says, In the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, Timothy. Preach witty, topical, encouraging messages that make people feel real good about themselves. That is not what he said. He said, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. That means preach the word when it's popular in your culture and when it's hated by your culture. Listen, rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why? Because there will come a time when people won't want to hear sound doctrine anymore. And instead, they're going to surround themselves with a bunch of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. What do our itching ears want to hear? You're the best. You'll be rich. You'll be blessed. And you won't have any problems. But Paul says, not you, Timothy. Hold fast and discharge your duties as a minister and an evangelist. Preach the word. Consider the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will enter through it. But narrow is the way, and small the gate that leads to life, and only a few are going to find it. 
How about Luke 14, 26? Anyone comes to me and doesn't hate father, mother, sister, wife, children, brother, sister, even their own life, this person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, if you're sitting next to your wife, I don't want any hate mail after this. I'm not literally telling you to hate your wife. (laughs) What Jesus is saying is the allegiance you have to him has to be so far superior to even the love of your immediate family that there's no doubt about who's in charge of your life. No doubt. Romans 12, 1 through 2 tells us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is holy and pleasing to God. This is a life of worship, not conforming to the pattern of this world. A pattern that says, love yourself, love money, love pleasure, eat, drink, and be merry. The pattern of this world outlines and promotes things like self-empowerment, self-motivation, self-esteem, self-help, self-love. Self-love is rebellion against God. And it's a new age way of thinking that has crept into the church. And it's not biblical. Here's the closing. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Why is the church and most of American Christianity powerless? Because we have preached endless messages about prosperity and about ourself and about self-help and about blessing and about worldly success while world's dying and going to hell. We could be preaching about God. Our Christianity has become so self-centered. It's void of sacrifice. It's a Christless Christianity. It's a crossless Christianity. And because of this, it's a pointless and a powerless Christianity. Any Christianity that does not have the cross as the centerpiece of its existence is pointless and powerless. Just join a social club or something. At least they probably have better food there. If you're going to entertain yourselves, go for the gamut. The power of Christianity... The power that we deny when we live this sort of other kind of Christian life is the gospel. The very thing that was in mind when this church was started. Because I was here. Let's reach people, the least, the last, the lost, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Offering a hope to a lost and dying world in a lost and dying community. Let's open our doors and tell them they're all welcome to come. Go to the highways and the byways and say, listen. Jesus is here, and he'll accept you as you are if you'll lay your life down before him. Many of you were here then, have been serving God here ever since. Some of you have came in since then. The gospel is the message of Christianity. Nothing more, nothing less. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew and then the Gentile. 1 Corinthians 1.17-18 says, God didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of His power. The gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us being saved, it's the very power of God. The linchpin of Christianity is the cross. It's the gospel. Without Christ intervening in our lives, friends, we are damned. We're damned. We're not mostly good people trying harder to do better. We are dead, damned people who Christ dramatically intervened in our life and saved us. And guess what our job is to do? Not to be comfortable, not to be happy, Not to be air conditioning, but it's to roll our sleeves up and live like living sacrifices unto a lost and dying world. The linchpin of Christianity is the cross. It's the gospel. It's the good news about Jesus Christ that saved a wretch like James Love and saved a wretch like Josh West. An old drug addict and drug dealer and liar and thief who God grabbed in his just mercy. In his just immense mercy. You know how God grabbed me? You know what he used? He used people. People who are sold out to God, who are willing to roll their sleeves up and and touch a dirty old filthy drug addict like me. The gospel message is Christianity. This book, 
by the power of God. And church, that's all we have. But guess what? It's all we need. We don't need gimmicks. We don't need formulas. We don't need five steps to whatever. Christianity is not about you. It's about Christ. It's about a life lived in honor of Jesus. In obedience to the scripture. As you daily follow Jesus. And proclaim his message of truth to the lost. In love. Remember today is the day of salvation. Today is the moment where everything can change for any one of you. Listen if you're in Christ. Maybe today's the day that you, you roll your sleeves back up. Maybe today's the day you get in the altar, raise your hand up and say, I ain't living like I should. You know how often I've got to realign my mind with God's word and ask for forgiveness and repentance? Every single day I look at my ugly mug in the mirror. Every day. But his grace and his mercy is renewed every morning. Let's be about our father's business. Listen, stories like James's don't happen because we're because a, a watered down gospel's preached. It's because we believe God raises the dead, not by my power or anointing, but by the the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the Scripture alone, and it's all for the glory of God alone. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach your word. Lord, I thank you for these people here, Lord, in this community. God, I thank you for the, the people who are serving you faithfully day by day, running cameras, singing worship songs, feeding homeless people, conducting men's and women's Bible studies. Lord, I pray that you would renew their strength like that of the eagles. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be unified in the truth, God, that we wouldn't grow weary in well-doing, realizing that the work we're doing is dependent on the power of your spirit, Lord. And the power of your word, not on our ability. Lord, I thank you for the pastors here and the, and the leaders here and all the people who attend church here. Lord, I pray if there's one voice, one person under the sound of my voice today who doesn't know you as Savior, God. Lord, that they would have the courage to ask somebody, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And Lord, that they would get a biblical explanation of what it means to follow you. Lord, the cost involved. Lord, the cost that you paid and freely gave to us. Lord, I pray every other person here would be united and encouraged in the truth, realizing that we are not doing this by our own power. This church is only standing because of the grace of God. And Lord, the true church, God, the grace of God will, will hold up. It will sustain. Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. So we desperately need to make sure that our church is Christ's church. And that we're living a life, Lord, that's in honor and holiness to him. Lord, not conforming to the pattern of this world, but being renewed and transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.